Welcome to the 24th episode of It Wasn't Me, a true crime podcast where we talk about murders and intrigue us. I am Cindy. And I'm Mercedes. Thank you for listening to last week's episode where we fer- featured the murders of Elizabeth Garcia and Patty Simon and a drug-possessed moron. Fair warning, our show can be extremely horrifying and graphic. We will use offensive language, so if you have kids, put them away for a while and join us for a murder. Also, be forewarned, we are passionate and always have been about true crime. But sometimes we will make jokes and we will laugh during this podcast. For more more information and links to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages, visit our website at itwasn'tmetruecrime.com. Subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, and please leave us a five-star rating. While you're there, give us a comment telling us which murder intrigues you. And if you like our show, please consider supporting us through patreon.com forward slash itwasn'tmepod. We appreciate our Patreon supporters more than we can express with words. Thank you so much. Hey, Mercedes. Hey, Cindy. How's it going? Pretty good. Welcome back. Thanks. What you been doing? Well, I've been ketoing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Really? Yes, I've been. Um, I'm, I'm like a dirty keto. I have. I I would have to say that. Yeah, I'm kind of dirty keto, but I'm also tracking a little bit, and I've dropped 13 pounds. That's Probably amazing. Ten of that water weight, but that's okay. Hey, that's 10 pounds. Pa- that's 13 pounds. Yeah, I've been eating some delicious, yummy, um, fresh. Like very wholesome dinners. Awesome. Yeah. How That's about fantastic. you? Fantastic. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. Like I said, dirty keto. Yeah. Have some wine. Oh well. Yeah. Cheers, sister. Yeah. yeah. Hello. <coughs> dirty keto. A little bit of Rebel or enlightened ice cream every now and then. Yeah. But for the most part, man, I'm packing in those micronutrients. Well, good for you. Listen, I even got my youngest son. He, um, I made this this meal, and it called for cauliflower rice and spinach, and I didn't tell him. No, and never. And he ate it, and he's like, oh, my God, that's delicious. And I just chuckled. He's like, what's so funny? I said, do you realize that you just ate spinach and cauliflower? <laughs> and he's like, wow, you know, I really, really liked it if it, when well, it's good. good like this. So, hey. Yeah. My kids liked it. I mean, I was doing it a lot during wrestling season, which is helpful for the kid cutting weight. Right. You know, as long as he makes weight. <clears throat> um. Still not bitter about that at all. So anyway, um, which we never talked about. You said, well, should we talk about that later? So here's the deal. My son, county champ, district champ for his for his weight class, qualifies to go to regionals, has to weigh 115. The little bastard weighed 115.1 and had to forfeit all his matches. But he's only a freshman. So he has, yes. you know, uh, let somebody else win it this year. He'll take it the next three. Oh, my husband is so like, no, they just didn't want a freshman to upset everyone. Well, and that, you know what? They, yeah, I, they have a really bad attitude. Even the coach is about freshmen. So whatever. Yeah. You know what? He'll he'll have his time. He he'll will. have his time. He will. It'll yeah. be the. Yep, he will. Yeah. All right. So uh, other than that, you know, I've been trying not to get sick and uh, wash your hands. hands. Yeah. 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 All right. So. I think I have a doozy for us. I'm excited. All right. So bear with me because a lot of the information came from a very biased source. Oh. So. Like a right wing bias source or a left wing bias source? (laughs) Um, Like extreme right wing. Oh, okay. But there are some that were um, not as, it was more middle of the road, but one of the more comical Sources were very far. Okay, so we need to uh, take this with a grain of salt, right? Yes. So are, here, are you ready? Yes. All right, so here we go. All right, so I'm pronouncing his name as in call. Okay. Because it's Gordon Call, K A H L. I would call it call. Right, like doll. Doll Call. Yeah. yeah. All right, so Gordon Call was born in Wells County, North Dakota. Ooh, we haven't been there before. Cold country. Yes, yes. All right, so on so he was born on January eighth, nineteen twenty. Damn. Okay, so we're going back in time on this one, huh? Yeah. Okay. All right. So Call had one sister, Lorene, who died in nineteen thirty seven at the age of seven, which is sad. Yeah. I don't. But you know, you don't. I don't think of people living a long time in that time period. You think it? I mean, it was only. 
It wasn't uncommon, I think. Nineteen twenty was a hundred years ago. If he is this man still alive? Oh no, we'll find out why. He's All right, alive. <laughs> he's not alive. Okay, so that's a hundred years ago he was born. Okay, wow, yeah. yeah so you're he taking would, us back. In, um, we're going back in time. <laughs> this is like biblical time, right? <laughs> I mean, but then no, I'm just teasing. It's it, it is uncommon. I mean, it's not as uncommon then for young children to die. I right. mean, like, my grandmother had siblings that died. My grandmother had siblings that died before she was ever even born. And my grandmother was born, like, way back then. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, she had okay. 18. She was number 18. And so, like, the first half was from wife number one. The first eight was from wife number one. She died. My grandfather or great-grandfather married a second wife. She had eight kids. Right. So. They would have a lot of kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So anyway, so he was raised on a farm. Call was a highly decorated turret gunner during World War II. So that tells you right there he probably had some issues. Sure. Because they didn't call it PTSD then. But I know from the dealings and conversations with my grandfather, they had it. Yes. All right. So after the war, he held a 400-acre farm near Heaton, Wells County, North Dakota. He bounced around also around Texas oil fields later in life as a mechanic and a general worker. Right. So in fast forward in 1967. So in 1967, he was 47 years old. Yeah. So fast forward. He wrote a letter to the IRS. All right. Stating that he would no longer pay taxes. And in his words, the synagogue of Satan under the second plank of the communist manifesto. So 1967, was that Lyndon B. Johnson or? Yes. Oh. Yeah. All right. Because Kennedy was killed in 63. So yeah, roughly. Synagogue of Satan. All right. Under the second plank of the Communist Manifesto. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. So during the 1970s, Call organized the first Texas chapter of the Posse Comitatus. Posse comitatus is how I say it. Yes. This is so interesting because I'm doing research on my next episode and it involves a posse comitatus. Surprise. Oh, this is going to be a great segue. So he organized the first Texas chapter. And and can you explain what the posse comitatus is? I sure will. I sure will. So all, give, give me just a second. So although he later left the group and was not a member at the time of his death. All right. But in 1976, he appeared on a Texas television program stating that the income tax was illegal and encouraging others not to pay their income taxes. So what in the actual fuck is the Posse Comitatus? I am sure you can imagine it's nothing good. <laughs> you say it like tater, like comitatus. No, Com- and it's like, and say it again, like in the Latin way. I, I would pronounce it com- com- comitatus. And that, and I'm sure it's And the the, I'm not a Latin. I've never taken Latin, but I have that Spanish background. Yes, and com- I didn't ask my comitatus. husband. Comitatus. And he did take uh-huh. Latin. That's how I was like, comitatus. Comitatus. All right. All right. So the posse comitatus, Latin for force of the county. All right. Was a loosely organized far right populist socialist movement or social movement in the United States. I was going to say <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Whoa. No. Social movement in the late 1960s whose members spread a conspiracy minded anti government, anti Semitic message in the name of white Christians to encounter what they believe to be an attack on their social and political rights. Okay, yes. Sound about right? Yeah, remember this for next week, people. Yes. <laughs> so many posse members practice survivalism. Hmm. And played a role in the formation of the armed citizens militias in the 1990s, also known as sovereign citizens. So the posse pioneered the use of false liens and other types of paper terrorism to harass opponents in frivolous law actions. Okay. And also, you know, you say survivalism played a role in their formation. These militias, so-called militias, um, they amass weapons. They amass food. They do drills, which we're going to talk about with mine next week. But they also await an apocalypse. They do. But let's, let me Wait, say that not everybody. Do you think they're freaking out <laughs> right now? <laughs> um, I would say yes, they are. But not all of them are crazy batshit, you know, crazy I people. would have to say that if you're in a movement like this, you are, and I'm sure that I don't have any posse comitatus members listening to us right now but uh, if you are call in 
please, because <laughs> I would like to know your reasoning. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So, Mercedes, as I stated before about the sovereign citizenship, have you ever heard of them? I, I want to say that I think, like, the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, Timothy McVeigh followed some of the philosophy and Probably. his partner. And I think that it had a lot to do with, you know, the the laws made by the federal government, they don't believe that they have to follow. They follow strictly what the founding fathers believed, right? They really believe that the 14th Amendment, the Red Amendment? The 14th Amendment was has to do with slavery and no well the wait. 13th amendment get frees the slaves, free slaves the fort, my, gave the right for african-americans to vote right no well, that's and to be they were citizens they were considered okay, they citizens. were citizens right, right so okay. some people say that the red amendment which is under the com which they call that because they say it's communist that um so that's where the red comes in is that the red amendment so the 13th amendment frees the slaves the 14th amendment makes us all slaves okay oh yes because so now, like, that's where the whole martial law comes in. It basically gives the federal government the right to do whatever the fuck they want, is what people believe. Okay, I'm going to Google the 14th <laughs> Amendment because I, I... That's what some people believe. I'm not saying that that's okay. the... all right. That's it. But basically, it says the federal government has the all power to do whatever they want, and that's how people can say that they can mandate federal, federal like, um, martial law. It says, all persons born or naturalized in the U.S. subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And then there are um, quite a few sections. Right. Representative shall be apportioned. That has to do with um, all male inhabitants of states being 21 years of age or in any way abridged except for participation in rebellion or other crime shall have the right to vote, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. No person shall be a senator or representative or elector who, having previously taken oath as a member of Congress, blah, 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 can engage in insurrection or rebellion against the government. So basically it's saying that you can't have an insurrection as a militia member or something like that is what I'm understanding. And, and I by I have no law degree at all, but that's very interesting. It's, it's so far beyond my own personal beliefs that I just can't take these people seriously, even though they're so dangerous. I mean, some people would say they are. Some people say that they have, they make sense. I mean, it's just. Okay. <laughs> I mean, okay, I mean, but I mean, I don't think that all of them are probably dangerous, like as in like this thing, like this guy turns out to be super dangerous. Okay. But I'm also not a uh, expert on sovereign citizenship. All right. So I will continue. The concept of sovereign citizenship originated in 1971 with the posse. Comitas. Comitas. Comitatis. Comitatis movement as a teaching of Christian identity. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that next week, too. God, oh how God. did you do this to me? I don't know. We have the same brain and two okay. different people. So, the Christi Christian identity movement, uh, Minister William Gale. All right, so I won't go too much into it. Since you're going to do next week. But some, those in the movement, believe that the term sovereign citizen is an oxymoron, prefer to label themselves as individuals seeking the truth. The sovereign citizen movement is a loose, is a loose grouping of American and Commonwealth litigants, commentators, test protesters, tax, tax protesters, and financial scheme promoters. Self-described sovereign citizens see themselves as an and only answerable to their particular interpretation of the common law and as not subject to any government statutes or proceedings. In the United States, they do not recognize U.S. currency. Mm, how do you buy stuff? And maintain that they are free of any legal constraints. That's so funny that they don't recognize U.S. currency, yet um, they, a lot of them, from my research recently, would come up with anything for to come up with U.S. currency. I mean, what else are they using? Right? Bitcoin? I mean, <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. They especially reject the most forms of taxation as illegitimate. Participants in the movement argue this concept is opposition to the idea of federal citizens, who they say have unknowingly forfeited their rights by accepting some aspect of the federal law. All right. 
you know, I mean, people get so upset about taxes and things like that. Oh, well, they do. Whatever. It's a hot topic. I mean, we, we promised that we were not going to get political at all, all nope. in this podcast. Mm-mm. So, you know, all I'm saying is that I wonder how many roads, and I know a lot of these people are militia-like, and they probably live off some dirt road somewhere off the grid or whatnot. But for me, I, I like the comforts of driving down a smooth highway with no, no potholes. Most definitely. I, I appreciate, um, you know, red lights and green lights and other things that come with my taxes. The interstate. Public schools, things like that. So, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, and from what my little bit of knowledge of a sovereign citizen, if you deem yourself that, like, you know, in Montana, um, I know that they don't particularly have to have a regular car tag. When you pull them over, they have some sort of paper. And there's another podcast that we both listen to that they say, I'm not, why, you know, they don't call it a car. They call it a vehicle. I was riding in my vehicle or I was in my vehicle. Like there's certain terms and the the verbiage that they use that can kind of like loophole-ish type stuff. Right. (laughs) Just, just super interesting to me that people have these thoughts, but you know, I guess people like that would live somewhere like Montana or North Dakota where there's not a whole lot of population. Right. And they seem to. And that's where, you know, I always joke that one day I see myself living on a compound in Montana. Really? I mean, I joke like, is it a bad joke? Oh, because... okay. <laughs> like a nightmare? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm like, I'm going to be on a compound in Montana in 15 years. We husband. love you, Montana <laughs> listeners. Yes. It's beautiful there. Or yep. so Google Images tells me so. Right. I haven't been there yet. So anyway, in 1968, this tax protester, Gordon Gall. Call. Call? Yes, Gall is a different person. uh, Stopped filing his IRS 1040 income tax returns. Okay, this is not anything catastrophic, I would say. I mean, there are people who don't file their taxes. My mom married a guy who hasn't filed his taxes in like 20 years. Yeah, I don't know how he's not under the jail. But anyway, that's a, that could be a different podcast. All right, so for nine years thereafter, the IRS ignored him. He was small potatoes in comparison. You know, he wasn't a wealthy man not paying his taxes. He was a m- meager farm farmer, you know. And actually, as it later comes out, you know, he fell under some um, exemptions, I guess you would say. But because of some of his own actions... You know, you don't wrong the IRS and then embarrass them. Well, and if you're doing it out of some sort of principle, which I'm guessing that he was. More he thought he was. That's another thing is when you're confronting the government like that, you know, you're drawing attention to yourself and you're going to get what you deserve, I guess. Right. So um, they pretty much ignored him for like nine years. But in 1977, Gordon spoke on an evening radio talk show regarding the illicitness of of income tax and some 250 phone calls would come into the radio station over the next two days either supporting him in some aspect or pledging to never file another tax return and that's when the irs gets upset right <laughs> and that's when they say oh yeah we got a revolution on our hands yes so with that the irs came down on him like a ton of bricks they said oh you really watch this So they quickly assembled a case against him, and two weeks later, through a criminal prosecution, like, through a criminal prosecution against him for violating Title 26, Section 7203, willful failure to file. Gordon was a low-income farmer, not even meeting the minimal statutory um, standards for the threshold of income levels achieved before requiring to even file his 1040. So really, he was making a bigger mess for himself than he needed to. He was drawing it. He was trying to draw a following. And obviously, he must have been charismatic because if he had that many people interested in calling in and joining his, I'm going to say loosely, revolution. You know, if you think about why our found, why we started the Revolutionary War anyway, that was one of the major grievances was unfair taxation. Yes. So, but this wasn't about to stop the IRS. You called him out. You embarrassed him. So they were... They were like, all right, get ready, because here it comes. He was convicted and incarcerated. For failure to pay to yes. file tax returns. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he went to so Leavenworth. that pisses him off even further. Yeah. So he went to Leavenworth, served his time, and was out on parole. He left 
the Texas Judicial District um, that he was confined to by claiming that some aspect of the restriction orders was defective. He soon moved to North Dakota, which was against his parole. So it was basically a parole violation. So and there he met his fate. A criminal summons issued from the federal court in Midland, Texas, was Texas was served on Gordon on August 8, 1980, charging him with a misdemeanor. Not a big deal, right? So, uh, however, he responded by informing the court that he would not be appearing and that the matter was allowed to be deferred until March 31st, 1982, when the Justice Department attained a federal arrest warrant citing his parole violation. All right. So he kind of dug himself a really big hole. He, for- sounds, I, he sounds like one of those old men who refuse to budge. Their pride is so big that... They're not going to admit that they're wrong or they're not going to just take a step back and say, okay, I'm not going to fight this battle. Right. When it sounds like he wouldn't have even had any taxes to pay. Right. Because he was indigent or whatever. And he's a farmer. Right. Well, the warrant was held up again until July 26, 1982, some 16 months later, when it was sent to the U.S. Marshal's Office in Fargo, North Dakota on February 13, 1983. The United States Marshals and the federal court in Texas knew of his whereabouts in North Dakota at all times. It wasn't like they didn't know where he was. After about two and a half year delay in the case, the fact that there was a problem controlling the prosecution of the case is self-evident. So in 1983, he is 63 years old. Yeah. He's not a young man. He's not, you know, he's not a 24-year-old trying to rebel against the government. So um, there was a chronology that had been published in the New York Times. Um, The context of it was discussing some of the other unfortunate incidents that happened. It would be referred to very defensively of the government, of course, as mere bureaucratic bungling. In an attempt to discredit the obvious interposition of the lateness of the hour operating against the government to bar the legitimacy of their management of the case. All right. So do you want to put that in um, in modern language? You can. (laughs) (laughs) Basically, the federal government is um, trying to legitimize their case by saying something about bureaucratic. They're trying to discredit. Uh, I don't know what you're trying to say there, but I guess did the federal government do something wrong? Well, we're about to find out. Okay, because based on what this saying, this is saying It seems like the government is trying to backtrack or cover their tracks somehow to make their legitimate, make what they did in this case seem legitimate. Possibly. All right. So this, a lot of this came from the uncensored story of Gordon Call. Okay. All right. So once again, Gordon has attracted the attention of the United States government, which is never really a good thing. No. Fly below the radar, people. (laughs) Definitely. So... With the personality known as Ronald Reagan as the president and William French Smith sitting as the attorney general, the word came down the pipeline to get rid of Gordon Call. And the stage was set for a kind of confrontation the feds wanted. All right. So why would they want to get rid of Gordon Call? Because Gordon Call is making a scene and making what these people did seem like they're dumbasses. Yes. And I think he's just calling up a lot of attention to himself and they don't like it. it. I mean, it sounds like to me, it's like the really wrong kind of attention. So, and a violent attack was, pl- I mean, again, this is from the uncensored story of Gordon call, which is very biased. This is where I said some of the information comes from a very right wing. What is it like Breitbart or something? No, 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 no. All right. So a violent attack was a, was allegedly planned against Gordon at his farmhouse. It was going to be very well publicized. The attack would be in front of a roadblock, which it did happen in front of it at a roadblock. It would be in the evening hours. It would occur in a remote rural area. Well, he lived in that remote rural area. Rural area. The timing of the, ta- the attack was February 1983. And it would collide with the trials of other related criminal prosecutions that were going on um, that would be favorably tipped towards the government as the juries were exposed to what would be surfacing visibly on the news as Gordon Call incident. All right. So things that are coming to my mind are things like Waco, Ruby Ruby Ridge. That was later, though. That wasn't I know. So, no, this is like another example of that with those. This is like the pre 
those men that went, what did they go to, like a state park or a national park and hold themselves up? Ruby Ridge. Those are, is that Ruby Ridge? No, that's a different one. That The one I'm talking about just happened like within the last oh, two or yeah, three yeah, years. Yeah. Yes, yes. These and are all the same type of absolutely uh, militia. Like they believe that they can form their own militias. And I know that the Second Amendment does say that. But I believe that it's in the protection of the I mean, the, the Marine United Corps States, was a militia at one time. Right? Well, I mean, yes, it was. A lot of them, that's how we won but, the American Revolutionary uh, War was a lot with the benefit of militias. Now, but this is not what we... Right. Uh, but another thing that, that I noticed goes hand in hand with this is also this religious belief. In, um, you know, women are usually treated as second citizens. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and that's part of it. They don't believe women are... African Americans should have the right to vote. Nope. Nope. All right. So from his farm in Heaton, North Dakota, both Gordon, along with his neighbors and the chief of police of Medina, North Dakota, Daryl Graff, all had received several advance notices. So they knew they were coming. That the United States Marshals were planning a very unpleasant reception for Gordon Call. And in the case of Daryl Graff, he was told bluntly, you're to stay out of it. Okay, so he's the chief of police, but somehow word got around to Gordon Call and his his followers. They I were all made aware. There's how many people are at this farmhouse? Do we know? No. Well, he he has a wife and a son. So it's just him, his wife and son, and they have this huge plan. Not really a plan, but. The government has this plan. The oh, government has a plan to get rid of him because he's making a lot of noise. And his he has a following and people are listening to him. I mean, lots of people try to make noise and say a bunch of crazy shit. But once you get it out there and you get a following, especially if you're on a radio show at the time, think of it like if you had a podcast now and you were talking this slander against the IRS and against the government and people were listening to it and like believing in it then that's something different i mean we call that you know cultish and you know crazy just wait until next week (laughs) oh lord all right so rather than meeting his adversaries face to face to settle this grievance at a lower level gordon was like fuck that shit he um ignored the gathering storm and tossed aside the warrant and said i don't give a shit about this giving his adversaries the benefit of intens- intensifying the impending confrontation into an elevated status. So he just like, because he was so flippant with it, fuck this, I'm moving, to, I don't care, you don't mean I'm anything to me. I'm not backing down, you're going to yeah. cross this line. I mean, just, it's He's stupid, a line in the dirt. Yeah. Um, bravado, that man, And you know what, I feel like men like that age, like it was seen as unmanly to back down at all. Yes. Like you wouldn't say I'm sorry. If Even if you are wrong, you wouldn't say you're sorry. Right. So uh, um, a level that originates out of the barrel of a gun where the feds were quite likely to prevail. I mean, the feds against this, you know, mediocre, mid-level farmer. Although they did not give the United States Marshals the right to come out. It didn't give them the right to, to come out guns blazing, firing off. All right. It does, however, require that other people in difficult positions with their uh, juristic authorities face compliment. Comp- contemplated extermination itself should not reciprocate or Repl- replicate not <laughs> a lot of big words I here. Know, I know. Uh, replicate gordon calls mo so basically mm-hmm. the federal government they just don't want him to be an example for other yes. uh lunat okay Go i'm ahead. not going to call them lunatics <laughs> um other thinkers like him they don't want that They want to get rid of this, nip it in the bud before he gets a bigger following and it's a bigger problem. Right. And they're like, look what we did to him. Don't don't get any crazy ideas. So on February 13th of 1983, Gordon, accompanied by his wife and his son, Yuri, left for a meeting in Medina, North North Dakota, in a commercial district and headed home. So they had a meeting. They left there and they were headed home. Gordon was under surveillance and he knew it. He knew that he was being watched at all times. He could have picked up um, 
He could have been picked up at the meeting, but the feds had a surprise waiting for him and they wanted remoteness of the rural environment. So I can definitely see the bias here in this writing. Oh, the feds had a surprise for him. Right, right. But I also think, too, you know, you don't want to take somebody down when they're in the midst of a bunch of other people that causes chaos and whatnot. So you take it somewhere a little bit more remote. Yeah, you let them get away. So maybe that that would lower the risk of casualties if it got crazy because it does come out later that, you know, He says some stuff. So his son, Yori, detected that something adverse and dangerous was in the air. So he took his father's jacket and cap and wore those on himself on the ride home that afternoon. So Yori, of course, is an adult because at this time, Gordon calls 63. So Yori is not a child. No, not at all. Yeah. All right. So what was actually going down at this meeting? Well, Call and his family drove from his house to Dr. Clarence Martin's clinic in Medina. Um, Martin was hosting a meeting of citizens concerned about the country's future. Farmers talked about the bad economy, but there was more going on. Allegedly, the people gathered in Martin's clinic that day were discussing the formation of a new township, one where creators could live by laws that they chose. One that would withstand the demise of America and the rise of a one-world government. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. They were not traditional thinkers. No. <laughs> um, Call son Yori was with him that day. So was his wife, Joan, and a family friend, Scott Fall. I'm saying it's Fall. I think it's Fall. Yeah. The three farmers were armed with two twenty three caliber rifles. That's it? Two two threes. Yeah. With, they were armed, all three of them had a two twenty three caliber rifle? Yes. So the dad, Gordon, the son, Yori, and Scott all three of them had these rifles. Are those high power? I don't know anything about oh, guns. I don't know. All right. The meeting was not secret, nor was the fact that the marshals wanted to arrest Gordon. Early that morning, anticipating trouble might stem from the gathering, Medina Sheriff's Depu- or Sheriff Police Chief, excuse me, Medina Police Chief Daryl Graff called a meeting of his own. He talked with Jack Miller and Bradley Cap of the Stutzman. Stutzman County Sheriff's Department about their course of action if Gordon showed up. They decided to leave it alone. Well, if he's not breaking a law, he's, um, you know, your First Amendment allows you to assemble. Yep, peacefully. Peacefully. Yep, and that's what they were doing. So there's nothing, no law being broken. I mean, we might think they're crazy and now, we might not think that they're traditional thinkers, but. You can't want to overthrow the federal government, right? Nope. But are they talking about overthrowing the federal well, government? Well, they're talking about starting their own um, township. township with a one world government. I mean, no. that's how you. To withstand the demise of America and the rise of oh. a one world government. Okay. All right. Remember, these are the whole like. This is their, yeah. Anti Illuminati people. Now that's, that's what we would call, say. All right. So... I like the Illuminati. <laughs> are you Sorry. talking about the old white man who started it or Beyonce? Oh, not Beyonce. <laughs> Did she start something like that? No. They say they're at the top of the Illuminati. Well, maybe they are, but I like maybe. the Illuminati. All right. So, well, uh, uh, no. <laughs> so the sheriff's department were like, you know what? This is a paperwork issue, not about a violent guy who is going to rob a bank or blow a building up. What's the big deal? Gordon made it very clear that if we left him alone, he'd leave everyone else alone. But if they came after him, he would start World War Three. And we didn't want anything to do with that. Well, yeah. I mean, why would they go? Uh, sure, he's not paying his taxes and he's wanted, um, what, for parole violation. That's one thing. Um, if he's trying to get a gathering to overthrow the government or something, that's another thing. Uh, and that that could be quite. We're not talking Oklahoma City bombing here. That's not what hit that. Yeah, that comes later. Yeah, that comes later. But this is not his plan. His plan is just let me live. I'm not paying my taxes, which I don't understand what his beef was anyway, why he had to start such a thing. If he really was falling under that threshold, he probably wasn't going to have to pay any taxes anyway. But I guess he's like, you know, for all the other people who shouldn't have to pay their taxes, I'm going to be that one guy and I'm going to. You never really know what, you know, it could be something like. There's a foreclosure on his home. He can't pay the taxes on his farm, the property taxes or whatever. Or maybe something happened to a friend or a right. family member or something like that. And it just got him all riled up. And he was like, fuck this. This is what I'm going to do. You know? 
So anyway, this cap guy drove by the clinic that afternoon and saw um, Call's now, station wagon in the parking we, can lot. Can you remind me who Cap is again? Is he the FBI agent or is he uh, the cop? He is one of the police officers. Okay. That. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, I see. So okay. He's, he's, a, he's a from the county sheriff's department. Right. Okay. But right. he's allegedly one of the ones that were like, you know, just let him be. So, but he drove by this clinic that afternoon, saw uh, Gordon's station wagon there, the and he couldn't resist. He checked to see if that warrant was still active. And it was. And it was. Okay. All right. So two marshals from Bismarck and two from Fargo would meet him in Medina as soon as they could. So he called in the marshals. Just before the marshals got there, um, Yuri spotted and then the meeting and the meeting, the men at the meeting decided to go home. They were like, he spotted them, saw the lookout and was like, you know, we, we might need to get out of here. So Yuri drove the family station wagon with his mother in the passenger seat the fall guy in Vernon Wing, uh, Wagner, Wagner, a streeter man who also attended the meeting. I don't know what streeter is. Maybe that's a city nearby. So all of these people were in the vehicle. And Gordon was also um, in a second car behind him with another guy. So there wasn't just the three of them at the house. Now we're taking they went fall the and Wagner and we're taking David Brower Yes, because they were all leaving this clinic where That's, they had the meeting. All right. Right. They topped the hill on the way out of Medina and spotted a pair of vehicles parked on the highway ahead. Another approached rapidly from the rear. The marshals had arrived. So do they have this? The pair of So uh, I'm a little bit confused here. Okay. So we talked about a roadblock earlier. Is this, this is that roadblock? roadblock? Yes. So, but then you said the, the sheriffs were going to just let it go. They weren't. They decided to leave it alone. They're going to let it go. So they, but they were still playing and do the roadblock. No. So this the calf guy just couldn't help himself, okay. even though he said. So he went ahead and went through with it, even though his. Yeah, he called in the marshal service. Okay. All right. So not far from the from his farmhouse, a roadblock had been set up by the by U.S. Marshal Kenneth Muir. It was a very unusual roadblock in that it had an ambulance and a fire truck awaiting. Why do you think there was an ambulance and a fire truck? Well, I'm, I'm guessing that they're imagining, they're guessing there's going to be trouble. I, that's what these, I would think. They know these people are armed. They're a, mil, a militia or they're sovereign citizens. They're not going to come down easy. Right. So, yes, there's going to be some trouble. The marshal had not come to arrest, but to murder, according to this article. To this biased <laughs> article. Okay. Yes. I, I'm wondering, did you check out the other side of this? I did, I did. Okay. I did. All, right. All right. So, bringing neither the arrest warrant nor identification, Deputy Muir brought his gun and orders to terminate Gordon Call. Arriving at the roadblock, Gordon's son's Yuri, son, Yuri, fled the pickup truck and ran to a nearby telephone pole, pole for cover. Thinking that Yuri was his dad, because remember, he had the, get up, the hat and the jacket, um, Marshal Muir opened the shooting by firing shovel, several shots at Yori. Yori did not fall to the ground quickly enough to satisfy the marshal. So Muir kept shooting until Yori fell. After spending a while at the hospital, Yori call would make us would survive, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But he was charged with would, would actually survive to be charged with murder. Right. That's why I said we'll get into it a little bit later. Okay. So I should just go to the next. No. Okay. So call and Brower. Call and Brower. Gordon Call. Yes, who was in the other car with this gentleman, tried to turn the two cars around, which allowed the marshals to get even closer to them. They tried, um, they had to stop. Yori and Fall were the first to exit, which we already talked about Yori trying to exit and he hiding behind the pole. The pole. Marshal said the two men had grabbed their rifles, pointed at them at lawmen. Fall said the marshals had their guns already out. Either way, it was a standoff. For nine minutes, men on both sides aimed their gun at e- guns at each other. So I want you to picture this. It was 545. The sun had doled out a wonderfully mild February day. And the light was fading. But by now, the only people left in their car were Joan, Call, Wigner, and Brower. Everyone else was armed and aiming a loaded weapon. So I picture this lonesome highway with these people like a western their guns just pointed at each other all right gordon call stood by his vehicle in the road yori ran off pointed a gun at the marshals got shot 
All right. Fall ran into the woods near a mobile home of Wayne and Susan Reardon, about 150 miles, I mean, 150 feet away. So they had this roadblock near someone else's home. Yeah. I mean, 150 feet is not that far. Because you think a, a, a football field is 100 yards. So 150 feet is... Not very far. Yeah. All right. So on one side of the roadblock, the U.S. Marshal Ken Muir stood outside his vehicle. Next to him was Medina Police Officer Stephen Sch- Schnabel? Schnabel. Schnabel. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Deputy Marshal Carl Wigglesworth, (laughs) who rode with Muir from Fargo, had run to the woods to cut off fall. On the south side of the roadblock were Cap and Deputy Marshals Robert Cheshire, 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 and James Hopson of Bismarck. The Marshals announced that they were there for Gordon. Well, of course, he refused to go with them. Neither side was going to lower its weapons, and the trees Wiggleworths, <laughs> Wiggle, Wigglesworth ordered Fall to drop his rifle, rifle and return to the vehicle. All right, so this was like a good old-fashioned, like, standoff. They weren't, like you said earlier, the men, these were men's men. They weren't giving up. They weren't putting down their weapons. They were like, this is it. So later, um, it was described from the Fall guy. Okay. <laughs> Fall was a fall, fall. guy. Fall <laughs> he call. took the fall. Wigglesworth, All right. Schnabel. All right. So, um, so we get an account from him, but also Wigglesworth is is quoted as saying, "Me and Scott had a standoff in the woods." Wiggle Wigglesworth said, "Both of us had our rifles pointed at each other, and I was in, I was stuck in the ice in the bog and couldn't move." God, I bet it was cold. And we talked about bogs like what last time or the yeah. time before? <laughs> yes, right? we did. Okay, he had me in his sights, no doubt in my mind, but he didn't shoot. I wonder why. Well, he's not going to shoot. Um, he's not going to shoot a cop or a U.S. marshal. Why would you do that? Exactly. So, but then, bam! Crack! The sound came, and the shot came from Cap's left. He jerked his head the way and saw Yuri call. So, call shot. Yuri did. Yuri call. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then Cap turned his head right at Cheshire, who had been struck by the bullet. So that's a U.S. Marshal down. All right. So second, that's, uh, that's, that's, big. that's war. Yep. It's on now. So a second, a second shot whizzed by Cap. He wheeled and shot Yori in the stomach with a shotgun. As all hell broke loose, guns erupted, fall on the calls, each fired in the Cheshire's direction. When the shooting stopped... Treshire and Muir were dead. Hobson and Yuri Call were critically wounded. Cap's finger was shot off and Schnabel. Schnabel had taken a ricocheted bullet to the thigh. All, all the injured had returned to the clinic to the aid of Dr. Martin. Oh At the God. same time, the men who had just shot each other were forced to stand in a room together and fire no more. So Wigglesworth was left to survey the damage. And God. I mean... That's a small town for you. That's some small town bullshit right there. All right, well, let's do a ceasefire. We all get stitches, okay? (laughs) Pretty much. That's what it sounded like to me. All right, so Gordon went over to the telephone pole, dragged his son, Yori. Okay, so his his white shirt was covered. And from blood, he was white from blood loss and bleeding profusely over to an unmarked police car, threw him in the police car, drove him to the hospital back in Medina, and then, in, as thick as fog, quickly settled into a Fargo County side. Gordon Call sped away into the night. So basically, he threw his kid out the car and said, Here you go, get help, I'm out. Okay. I mean, I guess he picked up his son and took him to the hospital. He could have just left him there, right? He said, what? He took his son. All right. He ran, before he fled, he ran over to the telephone pole where his son had been shot in the stomach, grabbed him, put him in the unmarked police car, stole the police car, essentially. Okay. All right. That's where I was wondering, where is, what the hell's going on here? Okay. <laughs> yeah, basically stole the police car, took his kid to the hospital in Medina and hauled ass. So then begins the manhunt. So soon a swarm of military stormtroopers descended on Fargo in military clothing using military trucks. They searched. Um, they were on a search and destroy orders. Gordon Call was immediately placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Wow. And was subject of the most intense fugitive search in the history of the FBI. Holy shit. 
it was a massive operation. Okay. All right. Keep that in mind that I just said that. All right. And a tight clamp down, a tight clamp down was put on North Dakota. Obviously, they were like, this dangerous man who killed U.S. Marshals. He's out and about. Don't come out of your house. All right. So they also had extensive random stops of motor vehicles, but nothing really ever turned up anything. Gordon, uh, for Gordon Call, thousands of armed v- armed forces were called into a search surrounding North Dakota countryside. Everything available, every available bounty hunter known to the FBI was hired and put on the case. But the fugitive Gordon Call slipped through it all. So this older man, sixty, what do we say, sixty three yeah. year old man, is now on the run. Yes, in North Dakota, and which he knows, right? Didn't he grow up there? or... Grew up back there. and forth, yeah. Yes, okay. Yes, he was born there, lived in Texas, came back. So in comparison to what they can do when they feel like it, it is worthwhile noting that J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI never showed any interest in, captur- in capturing unknown fleeing killers when President Kennedy was shot in Dallas. No roadblocks or dragnets or manhunts, no searching. Nothing but CIA agents carrying Secret Service credentials, credentials restraining people from approaching the grassy knoll for about 10 minutes all right so that's from a bias one (laughs) i would say so yes for the next three months gordon had found a home with some friends mr and mrs gittner and mr russell who kept moving him from house to house it was rather obvious to anyone that if he was ever found he would be killed immediately this reminds me of a movie a tommy lee jones movie did you see that movie where he's... fugitive <laughs> yes i love that movie okay. i know there's it's two one of those that you watch once or twice a year yeah. yeah the remember when i said he did a peter pan you were like a peter pan it was from that okay yeah so it was actually the fugitive, which is the one about the doctor Shepard, Doctor Shepard, who that's a true crime. That, that's like a uh, Harrison Ford, is uh-huh. it? Okay, yeah. And then there's another one with Robert Downey Jr. There's two, and I can't. And they're remember. both awesome. I U.S. Marshal, U.S. Marshal. Okay, yeah. It's it's someone that reminds me of that Jones. just a little bit, but I don't see Gordon Call as being the hero. No, I really don't. No, I mean. I see how this biased website or biased article is trying to turn him into the hero, but I feel like... If he'd have just paid his damn taxes. Or even if he wouldn't have been trying to turn people against... The government. The government. Mm -hmm. All of this is, like, preventable. None of this is, like, there's no... What are you trying to prove here? I just... It's nonsense. Right. It's absolute nonsense. So, in this time when they're looking for him, Mr. Russell's daughter, Karen Russell Robertson, noticed that her father was hiding Gordon. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Possessed with first-person evidence, she she turned and went to the FBI and spilled the beans. Because there's a reward, right? Yeah. <laughs> she was given $25,000 and the promise of immunity from prosecution. So, why would she be prosecuted just for holding, for helping to hide him? I guess. I mean, she just wanted to say, I knew about this, and maybe she didn't come forward right away. So all of this is taking place. They they live in Arkansas. So he went So from, he went from North Dakota to Arkansas. That oh. is correct. So the r- rural house where Gordon was staying was placed under FBI surveillance. Surprise, surprise. But the revolts, revolts, results were inconclusive. However, on the morning of June 4th, a special FBI team of animals and savage killers See, we're back to the yeah to the bias. Right. All right. So a team of probably FBI search dogs. All right. And some FBI agents. Uh, no, known as FBI SWAT team. Left their home base in Washington, D.C. Flew to Lawrence County, Arkansas on a private FBI jet. Once they arrived there, they were met by local FBI agents and other agents. And the law, uh, I'm sorry, the Arkansas State Police, the sheriff of Lawrence County, Arkansas, his deputies, and other U.S. marshals. They assembled from, assembled from all over the country. Several marshals invited to, <laughs> to this operation arrived too late and missed it. So, so they were yeah. calling in the cavalry. Later in the afternoon, it all began. The quiet, isolated, remote house was cordon- cordoned off. Roadblocks were set up and without Gordon detecting anything amiss. Soon that afternoon, Mr. Ginter left the house alone and was stopped down the road. 
He claimed his wife Norma was in the house alone. Now the house where Gordon was living was more closely surrounded. The sheriff, Gene Matthews, went to the front door to remove Mrs. Ginter from the scene. So it's kind of like a movie scene to me. Like they go up and they knock on the door. Excuse me, ma'am. Well, it's written very dramatically. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Right? Yeah, most definitely. But, you know, you probably did go up to the scene and was like, ma'am, you need to come with us now. And probably maybe tried to quietly remove her. So, But on our way out, the FBI allegedly started open shooting and saturated the house with bullets. But the Earth Shelter house was made with concrete walls and Gordon survived through it all without a scratch. The 36-year-old sheriff, Gene Matthews, was killed in friendly fire. It says that he was killed incidental to the FBI siege on Gordon's hideout. So maybe friendly fire he was shot. Maybe, but that's not the way it goes down in history. So after a while, as the firing stopped, the FBI, you know, had the house cordoned off for, um, for themselves while Delta Force animals conveyed on the house. Who wrote this? <laughs> well, I'm going to guess that you probably did. So it's, it's your <laughs> Delta Force animals. I did not write that. Okay. All right. So they oh they were like starved panthers going for a piece of meat <laughs> right i told you did you watch tiger what tiger king oh yet? i watched part of it oh, okay but i right. i got through a couple of episodes but we digress yes so gordon was found alive inside the home hiding behind a refrigerator he was supposedly allegedly taken to the living room thrown on the floor and worked over with the butts of rifles now it says numerous bones were being fractured and his teeth were smashed in and while people were rampaging in the house smashing pictures and television was television set overturning furniture a copier and taking a fireman's axe and chopping up a bookshelf yes marshals are probably pretty pissed off that you killed their buddies yeah so he probably did get his ass kicked he's an old man I don't think they probably cared. He was 60-something years old. He wasn't 80. All right. So while Gordon was pinned to the floor and still under attack from these gun, the butts of these guns. The Delta so, Force Panthers. <laughs> the Delta Force Panthers, yeah. So um, somehow Gordon got his hand chopped off. All right. That just does not sound <laughs> accidental. <laughs> All right. So and then went around and chopped off his other hand. Oh, so, ultimately, he was found dismembered. So, what? <laughs> both of his hands were chopped off as well as his feet were severed? That is correct. Oh, my God. And he was shot in the head at close range. And this is supposedly done by the U.S. Marshal or the FBI Delta Force. Yes, which Delta Force is not FBI. Delta Force is not. There's like a, that's a special. That's U.S. military. Yeah. It's something. Yeah. So, local residents monitor, monitoring this operation on the radio, on the police radio, heard a call made for some gasoline to be delivered to the house. Now that the murder of Gordon Call had been botched, the federals, the feds, were going to cover their own tracks and torch the place, which the house was set on fire, apparently. And when his body was recovered, it was burnt. And no hands, no feet. Yeah, and they, a shot in the head. And they found all of the hands, and they did find a foot, I believe. So the roadblocks were called off when Mr. Wade, the owner of the land, showed up in town alive and well. The body of Sheriff Matthews was taken to a local hospital, Later in the evening, after the fire the feds had set had died down, the charred body of Gordon Call was taken to a local corner. Is this, okay, so is this legit? Did they really set the house on fire, the feds? Like, is that? The house was on fire. Whether they set it on fire or he set it on fire, who really knows? So who was in the house? Just Gordon Call? He was the only one in there? Yeah, because the one guy left, the wife was there, the the U.S. Marshals came to the door, someone came to the door, the federal agents, the police officers, whomever it was, and removed her from the house. When local people viewed Gordon Call's dismembered body, they became nauseous and sick, stating that the man they had just hacked apart was not Gordon Call, but William Wade. Oh, okay, so I have two questions. First mm-hmm. of all, why would local people be viewing a dismembered body? That doesn't sound right to me. I don't know. Maybe it was kind of like Body and Clyde when they paraded them through town. Yeah, I just don't think that. This is 19, what, 83? Yeah. This is the first I've ever heard of this I mean, story. you're not talking medieval times here. No. So, Mr. Remember, Mr. Wade was the owner of the land, and apparently he resembled Gordon Call closely in age and appearance, and was well known to the sheriff and others. Was this a, you know, a... Case of mistaken identity? Yeah. Was it? I don't know. Did Gordon Call die? Was that his hand? Were those his hands and feet chopped off the bullet in the head? 
Well, later they say it was. So there was some confusion. Immediately there was some trouble. Massive series of roadblocks were erected again, and thorough searches of all automobiles over a wide radius were started. And it was believed that Gordon Call had slipped out again because they were saying, well, no, that was Mr. Wade. He got away. So then they were freaking out again. You said earlier that Mr. Wade, the owner of the land, showed up in town alive and well. Right. But But now they're saying that wasn't Mr. Wade, that that was really Gordon Call? Yes. That does not make sense to me. No. So the dismembered body was later identified as Gordon Call. But the bodies in the house were only lightly charred since the house was fabricated from cast concrete walls and fire never got that intense. The corpse identified as Gordon Call's was missing teeth, hands, feet, and had a bullet in the head without I mean, had a bullet hole in the head without a bullet and was extensively covered with tissue bruises and fractured bones. It was very shockingly and disgustingly as people who saw photographs of Gordon Call's charred remains taken by the coroner reported a stark and terrified look on his charred face. He had died in extreme terror, screaming violently from pain. They had gotten their man. The man who was the director of the FBI at the time that this murder operation (laughs) was performed was William Webster. He personally supervised it. And when you get to know William Webster very well, you will be acquainted with a great murderer. Hmm. Gordon, this is not this, what you're saying. No, here. no, okay. no. This is from this is from the uncensored story of Gordon Call. Okay. Gordon was later buried with military honors. Okay, that I find hard to believe because if you think about it, he was kind of a traitor to the U.S. A little bit, yeah, but he served his country honorably. Which you can't take that away from him, but... I know, I know. So back in North Dakota, allegedly, um, his wife um, allegedly received several mean and ugly death threats from the federal government to keep quiet or she would be murdered herself. I doubt very seriously that that took place. I mean... But if she was drinking the same Kool-Aid he was, she's probably going to, she's pissed off at this point. Her kid's been shot. Her husband's dead. She's probably going to say whatever. I mean, like I said, if she's as deluded as he clearly was. Well, and we, we talked a little bit about this before we started the podcast and that, you know, the women kind of just believed whatever the men told them or they were raised not questioning a man, their husband's decision or their yes. father's decision. And she would have seen the FBI as the bad guy. Yes. Here. You know, here they are coming in our to our house, shooting us. This this is an interesting story for sure. Mm-hmm. It's very, like, mm-hmm. like you said, theatrical. And, right. You very know. dramatic. Yeah. So, meanwhile, the rest of the country went on, like, Alice strolling through Wonderland, <laughs> believing that all was well, and the federal government is your trusted friend, and that some little tax protester over there got what he deserved and i can see where some people would think that i'm all for you know what protest your taxes but don't Don't gather an arsenal and threaten to kill somebody or what i mean when you go up against the u.s marshals and the federal government and you know really you got to be careful well you do and i don't trust the government wholeheartedly but then again you know what i am not going to um, raise hell over paying taxes no, for I, things that I use. I pay my taxes like a good little girl. So back in Arkansas, while shifting through sifting through the moldering ruins of the kitchen, a reporter from the New York Times, accompanied by Raid Ray Wade, you know that guy who might not be alive but is alive, uh-huh. the landowner's son found Gordon Call's left foot. Oh. Okay. Yeah. It was taken to a local corner in Little Rock, confirmed to be Gordon's sliced-off foot. However, this was news not fit to emphasize, and the reporter story was blurred when printed. You know, they were like, yeah, we don't okay, want to tell so anybody about that. So it wasn't, that. like, front-page news? No, because so. they were trying to hide. It was actually on page 14 of the July 3rd, 1983 New York Times. Yeah, because they were like, yeah, you know, he kind of got what he deserved. We don't want to, you know, how the hell did his feet and hands get chopped off? That's brutal. If. So there's an aftermath to all of this. So Mr. and Mrs. Gintner, who had been harboring Gordon, were charged not only with abating and abetting a fugitive, but they were also, also charged with fraudulently, I'm sorry, they were charged with the murder of Sheriff Matthews. So because they were abide, abating, aiding and abetting, and this deputy, the sheriff, died, they were inadvertently charged with his death. So at trial, the only evidence introduced against them 
outside of the background story was first person evidence from Art Russell's daughter, Karen Russell Robertson, who was the one who called the FBI, who reported to the jury that she had seen her father um, harboring them. And eyewitness evidence that the Gittners and the Russell and Art Russell were convicted and sentenced to protracted incarceration in a federal penitentiary. I don't know what protracted incarceration. Well, protracted means long, right? I guess, yeah. But that's the only thing that says anything about their their incarceration and right. in just in a federal penitentiary. Um, Mr. Ray Wade, who found Gordon's foot, was supposedly also threatened with being killed if he did not remain silent, which I don't believe any of that. They might have been maybe some by some gung ho pro FBI, pro military, pro government people, possibly. But I doubt the FBI threatened to kill him. I, I just I just don't I, believe I, that. I, I, yeah, I don't believe a lot of it either, but who knows? I mean, how would his hands and feet have gotten chopped off? That's my question. No, I mean, I get that, but I don't think that he was probably, um, that his wife or these surviving people were threatened with their life to, which would go into some other, like, paranoid stuff that we talked about before, you know, like the gang stalking and like all of that right. that we talked about. Yeah. So, I mean. Right. I mean, maybe. I mean, there are people out there who believe that the federal government does that to try to scare you into submission. I'm not saying that it's true. I'm just saying there are people out there who whole, wholeheartedly believe that. So one of the um, the fall guy okay. who was with him. The fall guy. The fall guy. Um, he went to prison. So there's three of them that actually went to jail for murder. Um so he does an interview later, and he says that he goes back to Medina nearly every day for the last 20 years at the time of this um, this interview. So he basically relives it every day. Yes, that's what he's saying. So his version of events, he's innocent. But that, of course, is the mantra of all incarcerated, right? Right. Because it wasn't me. It wasn't me. All right. So he repeats the, the same story long enough. It begins to ring true, and maybe he starts to believe his own tale. So fall... Yori and Joan Call all went to trial for murder. But, you know, they're not going to see things from the other side. They're, to them, it's their right, mm -hmm. their right to assemble, their right to do what they want. And mm -hmm. the government interferes. And that's just another example of how the federal government is ruining. Right. But whatever. if daddy would have just gone with them, son would have never fired his weapon, probably. Son wouldn't have been shot. Mom wouldn't have had to go through this. This other guy wouldn't be in jail. Dad would have just said, you're right. I'm going with you. I'm not going to cause this fucking chaos. You know, so ultimately, it's still, this, it's still Gordon's fault. So, Mom, Joan, the wife, was acquitted. Well, oh, good. Okay, so Yuri and Fall were found guilty of second-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Wagner got a plea deal in exchange for his testimony. Brower was convicted of conspiracy to assault and harboring a fugitive, and he got 10 years. Three convicted men appealed and lost. During a life sentence, one has time to think and what happened and what might have been. Fall said the jury went into the trial biased against the defendants because of the media coverage, which had slanted toward the prosecution's point of view, which we kind of are today. You know, we're like, well, if you wouldn't have been such an idiot, you would have just... You cause this, this is, this whole circus is because. But the thing is, is that we have, we elect representatives to go and make laws for us. Whether or not you agree with the laws that they make or who our president is or who your governor is or whoever, that person won by a majority of the vote. So you, whether you like it or not, does not mean that you go and have an arsenal and try to overthrow the government. Right. Right? Mm hmm I mean, yeah, there are those people who say... I mean, well, the you know, power is in the vote. It's not in no, I, I, a shootout. No, you're right. At 100%. This fall guy believes that what really happened that Bloody Sunday was different. I mean, in his mind, like you're saying, his version of events is completely different than what I would even call reality. Fall said the marshals pulled up with no announcements of who they were. They knew who they were. They knew they were being watched. They all... Um, all they uttered, he said in a recent interview from prison, was, we're going to blow your goddamn heads off. Like, well, you know, they probably did say that. Surrender or we're going to blow your goddamn head off. Right. From my perspective, I was assaulted that day by armed men who did not identify themselves and threatened to kill me. Bullshit. He knew who they knew who they were. Well, and whether he heard it or not doesn't mean they didn't say it. I mean, 
Yeah, but you can't, for, you can't I mean, I'm not going to be convinced that they didn't know who they were. Right. Everyone. Point- Especially if you have police officers there and you see a fire truck and you see an EMS and you see police cars. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. And everybody knew that Gordon Call had a warrant out for his arrest. Right. All right. So everyone points at that they had an arrest warrant for Gordon Call, but they didn't have one for me. So what they did was assault me. Well, no, that's not how this works. Good, right? (laughs) No, this is not how this works. Contrary to what came out at trial, Fall said the marshals pulled their weapons first. Once he saw their weapons, he grabbed his in self-defense. That they weren't barging in your house. You didn't know who they were, and you fired and felt self-defense. You knew exactly who they were. All right. Then he headed for the woods. A clear sign. He said that he wanted no part of what was about to go down. Yeah, except for you go in the woods and then you're covered by trees and you can shoot like a sniper. Yes. So why didn't he drop his weapon when Wigglesworth demanded it? I heard him say nothing. Right. So you didn't hear that. You didn't hear them announce who they were. Yeah. Whatever he said blew right back towards him. He claims I was supposed to go back to the area where I was assaulted. What was he insane? Besides, what authority did he have to tell me what to do? Did he have an arrest warrant for my arrest? It doesn't fucking matter if a fucking U.S. Marshal Police Department podunk police guy says, drop your goddamn weapon. You drop your goddamn weapon. Sorry. Okay. So once the shooting started, Wigglesworth said he looked away from Fall to the source of the noise. After that, he lost sight of him. At some point, Fall fired Cheshire's direction. He said he did He did so after shots flew at him. So he was saying it was in retaliation. He's. Uh, he goes on and just, I mean, he just goes on and on about how my own, I was in fear of my own life. I. This was all in self-defense. And no one really gave a shit after that, at that point. You know, he's just deluded. He just starts to believe his own tale, like I said a little while ago. All right, so there was some more fallout over this. So the sleepy little town of Medina, population 300, that's a tiny town, Mm -hmm. had awakened to a nightmare of gunshots, murders, accusations, and a deluge of law enforcement officers and media. After the shootout, the town's mayor fired Graf and his police officers because they didn't play a bigger role in pursuing call. Graf said that he kept quiet for nearly 20 years after the event out of respect for the families of the dead marshals. He took a lot of heat. He developed post-traumatic distress disorder. Um, Gordon Call had a deep-seated belief that while he was in jail the first time, the government tried to kill him, Graf said. He was not going to go back to jail again. It didn't take a genius to look into a crystal ball to see what was going to happen in Medina that day. I did everything humanly possible possible to protect the citizens. I had them move the roadblock out of town. I had an am- ambulance ready. I stopped citizens from driving into the area. The arrest attempt should have never happened in that day in that way. So he agrees that the U.S. Marshals probably uh, jumped the gun on that. Probably a little overzealous. Right. But they're pissed off that their buddies were killed. Right. I mean, I see both I, I see both sides there. Yes. I'm not saying it's right. I just... I mean, there was a lot of fallout. I remember after Waco happened, there was oh, a lot yeah. of fallout o- over that and Ruby Ridge and some of the others. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is, um, you know, who are you to hole up somewhere and, and defy laws for the common good right i did a research paper on david koresh i have no no love laws well, there no but i mean even ruby rich like that was the same thing it's like very mm-hmm. cultish yeah episode maybe <laughs> okay. all right so life does go on so the funerals for muir and cheshire am i saying that right cheshire cheshire were held the week after the shootout muir's wife lois had died lynn cheshire's um uh, robert lynn cheshire robert's widow moved to seattle crooks which I didn't mention him, who recently retired from the U.S. Attorney's Office, said that he still thinks the case, thinks of the case quite often, as does Wiggleworths, who retired and lives in West Fargo. Yuri Call is a prisoner currently at Leavenworth in Leavenworth, Kansas. Um, he wouldn't comment to any kind of anything. His wife only made one statement. Now, not Gordon his wife. Call's wife. Gordon Call's wife. Yuri's mom. Yes, right. Yuri's mom only made one statement, and her statement is. It was a tragedy and a nightmare I've lived with every day of my life. Um, if the government had left us, left us alone that day, none of it would have happened. We didn't go out looking for trouble. What do you think about that? Well, I agree. But a lot of times if you have a warrant out for your arrest, if it's a federal warrant, you uh, you might not go out looking for trouble. 
But I don't think that you're going to get away with it for long if they're looking for you. And when they do come, you don't respond by pointing guns at them. Right. That is correct. So whether you think you went out looking for trouble or not, it was just stupid and I have no sympathy. No. So the U.S. state attorney at that time, Crooks, said that the marshals acted on a valid warrant. They are not in the wrong. Fall was denied parole. He works as a clerk in the prison bakery. He, of course, maintains his innocence, says that he thinks about it all the time and that um, he's innocent of the charges and was supposedly convicted uh, in a very difficult situation. I cannot come to any closing. It's like an albatross. If I was guilty, I could accept that. But it was thrust upon me and I hate it. He is like deluded. He really thinks that he had no part of this well and the thing is is maybe he didn't realize when he got in the car with this guy what was going on you know but he was armed but he was armed you know what but when you're talking about montana or north dakota or whatever i mean those guys have their they're all armed yeah but you don't take you can be armed but you don't point your gun at a u.s marshal right you drop your (laughs) weapon right so um wigglesworth actually states that fall's best shot at ever getting out of jail is to stop trying to get out of jail right just shut your mouth yeah (laughs) Showing remorse might take might get you a long way, but you know that's not ever going to happen. So, but happy endings are the business of brothers named Grimm. In reality, endings are seldom as rosy or even black and white. Most often, they are murky. One person sees it like this, and another sees it like that. In real life, sometimes ends with two dead marshals, a dead outlaw, and two farmers doing life for murder. There you go. There you go. That's all I got. Hey, pretty good. It was a doozy, yeah, wasn't it? And it really kind of sets the stage for next week. So yes. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about that one. I'm excited to hear about it. Yeah. Well, for this week, uh, it's time to say goodbye. Yes. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you were just as intrigued by this week's murder as we were. We appreciate our passion. We appreciate sharing our passion with you. And we thank you for your support. If you'd like to support us even further, you can subscribe to our podcast and give us a five star rating. While there, leave us a comment about absolutely anything. Your subscription and ratings are essential to our success and helps push us up, up the charts. Up, up, up. (laughs) You can do this on your favorite platform. For more information and links to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, please visit our website at itwasn'tmetruecrime.com. We are so grateful to spend our time together and share our murderous stories. Thank you so much for listening to us and supporting us and not thinking we are total weirdos. We would like to thank our Patreon supporters. They are the extra. You too could become one of our beloved patrons by signing up at patreon.com forward slash itwasn'tmepod. Subscribe to our podcast and leave us a rating. And again, guys, remember, it it wasn't wasn't me. me.